Hello there, everyone. I don't know if anyone's joining in just yet, but um, I'll get started in a sec. Just see if anyone pops in. Oh, I see a weird eye. Oh, there's two eyes. So someone's using three eyes now at once. That's a little bit concerning. Um, and we have people waving. This is good. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so my name is Casey Stevenson. Um, I've been on here before. And tonight I'm going to do a brief little talk about Druidry in the Garden. Um, and yeah, practical gardening um, as well as spiritual practices connected to that at the same time. And while I'm talking, there are all these pop-ups coming up. Uh, it's pretty trippy. Yes, hello everyone, nice to see you. Thanks for coming and joining along on the adventure. So yeah, I've written notes so that I can somewhat keep track of what I'm doing and the thoughts that happen. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, okay, let's start with what do I mean by Druidry in the Garden? Well, yeah, I suppose logic, like, obviously, we're talking about connecting with our garden, the place that we plant, cultivate, sow, um, you know, uh, create compost, uh, and form relationships with, with the plants and the animals around us, and the minerals in the soil and the microorganisms, etc., uh, and where does the Druidry come into that? Because someone, you can just be any old, um, you know, Joe Bloggs and be an amazing, amazing gardener. Um, what is the Druidry bit, uh, that can come into your gardening practice? And there are, there are lots of things, uh, that you can include in your gardening everyday practical, um, methods in gardening, which are very Druidic. Um, and, of course, I think probably all druids as a rule love gardening, or at least love plants uh, and nature. So there's going to be no dilemma whatsoever uh, with this. So, some points on, I suppose, practices that we can weave into our gardening. There are, we can do rituals to connect with the spirit of place, with the garden with the plants. Um, we can do uh, different types of meditation techniques, um, uh, including very fundamentally mindfulness practice, I think is incredibly important kind of base point um, for, yeah, just being aware of the seasons in your garden, the animals there, the plants, what are they doing at different times of the year, what species are there, what's growing. Um, and what does it feel like on a heart and soul level? What does the land feel like in your blood, in your bones, mm -hmm. um, in your heart and soul? And so, yeah, embodying that um, sense of connection with land um, will give you a really strong sensation and perception of the animistic qualities of the plants and the land around you which you're going to be working with. Another point, and especially in my practice, and I think it's the same for probably most druids, is um, that great sense of reciprocity. Um, and when we're talking about that, we're talking about a um, relationship which we form with the world, or gods, goddesses, spirits, ancestors, where we form bonds by um, some kind of exchange or some kind of relationship that we form where it's through offerings, physical offerings or more energetic offerings um, like a poem, a song um, or it could be something that's biodegradable which we leave in the garden with a prayer uh, to bless the land and to sanctify or um, yeah, bless the space. Um, and we've got divining. Divination is another great tool of connecting and communicating with the spirits of place in a garden. And 
I, I think it can be very useful, um, yeah, if, I suppose if you're coming from it from this point of view that, yeah, there really are kind of conscious spirits in nature that are part of plants and that are plants and that are animals and things and that you can have a kind of communication with them on a divinatory level. Um, and by using the Ogham system, by using oracles, by using lots of other different systems, we can find inspiration uh, and, yeah, um, inspiration from the land. And that's, more, I suppose, more on an abstract, esoteric level. And of course, there are a lot more um, earth, earthly, kind of everyday kind of ways that we can just observe and look at the land and what it's telling us. Um, and, of course, there's the will celebrations, the eightfold will of the year. You can go into your garden and collect flowers that you've been growing for a particular seasonal festival. For example, yarrow here, it starts to really flower for um, the summer solstice. So it's a really good uh, flower to use for that time of, of year. Um, it starts to come out around Beltane, but yeah, definitely summer solstice time, it's peaking. And so that's kind of, I suppose, a summary of different ways that we can connect with the garden, with the spirit of place. And especially if we're moving into a new house as well, um, and we're familiarizing ourselves with the land and with the, with the place there, it's really good to spend time, and it, can, it, it doesn't matter how long, it's not about rushing it, it's actually about being as slow and as receptive as possible because it is all about that divine relationship with you and other, with your soul and with the soul of nature. And if we can build on that relationship, it all starts with mindfulness. It all starts with being aware of what's going on around you. But you will find, and, and if you're more of an intuitive person, and if you do have a perception of conscious beings, um, you know, animated within nature, then you will want to sing your heart to the tree and you will want to give offerings and you'll want to really prepare um, in appropriate ways that make you feel like you're harmonizing with the land around you. Um, because again, it's, it's quite easy just to go out and start cultivating the soil or things like that. But there's another layer which we can bring into it, a completely deeper level and one example I'll give is about the preparation of a garden space before the practical, physical taking up of, you know, shovels or, um, or pitchforks, you know, raging at your neighbours because they're blaring music at three in the morning. <clears throat> yeah. Um, anyway, what was I? Yes, back to not music right now. Um, yes, so preparing a space in the garden. So something that I have been doing for a long time now is when I plan out a space, I will go into the garden and I meditate anyway in the garden all the time in nature. And so, of course, you've got the meditation aspect. But then there's also this need within me anyway to express that relationship ritualistically. So there's a meditation aspect where there's that sense of self and nature and them becoming one or recognizing that they are one or that there are two aspects of, of the same kind of process. And then there's this ritualistic element which acknowledges the experience of the other. So the spirit of nature as on one level being a part of us or us a part of it, but on a, another level again, on a maybe subtle or astral level, there is uh, spirits that have their own free will and consciousness. And these spirits and guides and guardians of a particular place uh, will often be centred in that space and in, in that space and time and with those seasons. So one thing that I love to do is, yeah, prepare some offerings uh, which feel right. And of course, they, they always have to be organic. That's one rule, um, of course. I mean, that's pretty obvious. You're not going to be like taking out, I don't know, plastic or something. 
and, and offering it to the earth and burying it. No, 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 no. Um, that's really bad. Uh, so yeah, anything that's biodegradable, um, organic, um, food stuffs, berries, seeds, things that are going to break down and go back to the earth is what, is what the spirits of nature want. Um, and of course the gods and goddesses as well. So go out into the land, you got your space kind of, you know, you're going to do, but before you do anything, before you even pick up the shovel, before you even lay out cord, before you measure things, you sit with the land, you meditate for a while, you deep breathe with the air in that space, and you open your eyes and you see the trees around you and you become aware of the consciousness of all the plants, of all the green, of all the animals, of the bird song, of the ants, of the worms. You really just, and it's a contemplative practice as well, because you're contemplating this idea of animism in the environment in real time. As you're meditating, you are, you're, you're connecting into that um, perspective on reality, that, um, that ideology or that um, philosophy. And so animism, it's, 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 a very, it's a living practice. It's not just something that you know, you believe in, but it's, it's, it makes sense because you practice it. Um, it is in the actual practice of connecting with the spirits of the land or with the gods of a place and goddesses of a place that you um, experience that animistic um, experientiality um, of nature. And so, yeah, you sit with the land and you explain to it your ideas and what you want to do and you form those relationships and you give offerings and you pray to the space that it is blessed, that is protected and nourished um, in, yeah, in lots of different ways. And you ask that the spirit of place or that the plants help you as well to look after your garden and maintain it. Um, and that the plants in that space will grow and flourish and thrive and, and that the ecosystem benefits uh, from your efforts. And so all of these things we can weave into our um, more mundane, yeah, just physical practices and activities that we do in the garden. And of course, you don't have to do it all the time, but taking that time out and talking to the spirits of place, that's what they really appreciate. I deposit my organic tea leaves in the garden, usually around my roses. That's great. That's awesome. Um... Yes, please, please share uh, how, how you work in the garden and communicate with the spirits of place. Um, uh, yes, it's, it's a very good thing to do. So, yes, now where was I with that? I go on tangents, you see, I've written this list out, or like a, not a list, but I've written dot points, and I just go, blah, 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 and then I lose it. Um, but, I mean, yeah, um, what was I going to go on to from here? So yeah, forming those relationships is fundamental. It's, um, it's basic, I think. So kind of building on that and, and, and thinking about animism, mysticism, self, other, there's a sense of spiritual codependency which occurs. So that if you meditate with yourself, you get that sense of the I, the sense of self. But if you contemplate the sense of the other, you open the doorways to the realization of it and through being aware of the body that's part of that process of embodying the earth um, within yourself you can become quite centrally aware of the environment around you so this is one of the basic building blocks of becoming aware of your garden as well um, so Within the plants and within nature, there is that definite lesson within esoteric wisdom, I think, of the concept of spirit um, as being imbued and embodied in matter, but also um, going beyond matter. So I suppose it's a panentheistic um, kind of uh, view of, of, on the world. And... It can be also pantheistic. The two, the actual two concepts are different. Panentheistic is the divine embodied within the physical world, but also extends beyond it. So I suppose this world and the other world, they are actually interconnected, but the other world also 
goes beyond it into the spirit world or what have you. Pantheism, strict pantheism, is the idea that the physical world is is the divine, um, and that's it. That there's no going beyond the empirical universe. So God is the empirical universe, etc. Um, so yeah, two different ways, I suppose, of relating to um, the embodied universe. Um, and of course, these are more abstract ways of relating to the garden. Um, but on a practical everyday level, if we talk about practice, when you're connecting with your herbs and you're planting your herbs, you're going to form the those intentions of what you're going to use that plant for or that herb for and because you're using it for things you want to form a relationship where you are taking part of it in and then you give something back um, and so yeah again forming those bonds is really important um, there are two concepts in Druidry which I'll talk about briefly which again come deeply into especially plant magic in the plant world, um, the concept of Nuivre, uh, which is in Druidry is described as the universal life force, basically, and then the Arwen. Now, Nuivre is fundamental to the whole universe. It is in stones, it is in plants, it is what animates everything. Um, it is, I suppose, the quintessence of, of life and of existence. Um, it is the consciousness in the atom and in the sun, um, and it is the, yeah, it is the spirit, I suppose, in its most um, essential kind of almost atomic, physical, not physical, but like physics kind of way, I don't know. Um, then the Arwen is the inspiration of the land in this, in this context. It is the inspiration which comes forth as the sap flows up through the plant in spring. It is that quickening of inspiration through the leaves and through the flowers, which then we harvest and ingest, or that we use to heal ourselves and other people, or to mix into the soil for green manure. And so there's that direct connection with the green world and with Arwen and Nuifre. Um, and there are Practical ways that we can work with this, when you're planting a tree or a plant, in Druidry we have different techniques and practices for planting trees. We'll have a, a tree planting ceremony, um, and Arwen is chanted, and when we're chanting Arwen, we're visualising that the life force of the tree is extending out through its roots and up through its branches and leaves. And as it does this, it is um, th those essential qualities that, that sustain its life are growing in power and in force and um, intensity uh, so that it has a much better chance at, survi at surviving um, and, and, well, not even just, you know, like flourishing, really th flourishing and, and, and um, thriving. So we do those uh, practices. And so that's the type of green magic um, is, uh, yeah, focusing the intent um, and connecting with the spirit of the plant. And how am I going for time? I'm losing track. My phone doesn't even tell me the time at the moment. It's got just the screen with everybody's comments and things. And I can't... If anyone wants to tell me, like, if I'm going over at any point or whatever, um, please do. I don't even know. If I press backwards, I don't even know if it will actually... Yeah, it might cancel the whole thing. Um, so, yeah... And an, a, a, another essential way that we connect with the garden is through bringing them on camera. The plants! <laughs> Actually, I've got some ferns in my room. I should do that. Hey, um, here, I'll show you. This is not a fern. This is a ficus, but it's a little dwarf fig. And um, I've been building a relationship with this dude. I just put him in a new pot. He's got a nice green pot. But this is my kind of sacred little ritual meditation space. And I will sit in my inner grove. 
which is, you know, as above, so below, as within, and as without. It's um, when you sit within the inner grove, you're sitting within the grove, the nematon within you, but extends outwards into the world, and the world is also reflected in. So it's it's a two-way stream. Um, and when I sit in this space and I'm connecting with the grove, the trees here, the physical trees, they enter uh, into my into my um, inner grove as well. And so there's that communication uh, which can occur. Um, and directly talking to your plants is a really good way, I think, as well. Because if you're coming from the, this perspective that, yeah, I suppose the plants... Uh, listen to us and they um, understand us on some level, on some deep level, that whether or not they can understand the words you're saying, it's, again, the intention and the feeling behind it. And whether it's just psychological or if it's much more than that, I think is also a little bit irrelevant because everything is psyche, um, basically, I think. Um, our perception of the world, everything we base ourselves on is purely because... Uh, we are we have consciousness. Um, it's hard to say what experience would be uh, without consciousness. I mean, what is that even? We don't even know what we are without consciousness. So that we can experience in the world as an inherent part of the universe and of nature. So where am I up to? Yes. Um, Practical aspects, you know, um, again, going back to those more magical, they're also practical because they're hands-on. And another thing I do is when I'm putting compost around a tree or a plant, I will connect with, the, with that compost and I'll talk to it and I will, I will connect with the spirits and the microorganisms in that soil um, and thank them for their nourishment and for their blessings and I will thank the mother and I will thank the earth, um, and all of those um, beneficial spirits uh, for this blessing. And then I will place it around the plant. And so there, there's a many-fold way of practicing this. Um, and of course, on a purely physical, more practical level, you've got the permaculture, and biodynamics comes into it in a big way as well. And um, I think druids uh, tend to be very in favour of permaculture and biodynamics. Um, they're very cool, exciting practices to get involved with. So, yes, yeah, so just briefly talking about the different ways, different modalities in a way of connecting with the spirit of the land. There's one level which is the contemplative practice of going out and reflecting on your own inner process um, in relationship with your experience of the world around you and reflecting back on that um, and, yeah, experiencing that, I suppose, in, in that kind of more reflective way and thinking about, I suppose, your place in nature, um, your place in the garden around you, um, you know, your connection on a biological and um, physical level, atomic level, with the borage that grows and the yarrow that grows and the and the gum tree that grows, um, you know, in, in your backyard, um, that's a contemplative, meditative practice which you can do, you know, um, and I think it's really fundamental. And building on from that is yeah more of that animistic awareness of recognizing that outside of your psyche that yes. The tree does have its own um, sentience, uh, and the rock has its own sentience, and that you can actually communicate with the spirit of that thing. Um, and in a way, that's building on, but it's also a little bit different to a simple contemplative practice, in a sense, because whereas you're reflecting on just your own psyche or your psyche in connection with the world, you're kind of going beyond that. Um, and viewing the world uh, as imbued with lots of conscious beings that are doing lots of things all at once. Um, and, yeah, 
So I think I've basically summed up what I was going to talk about um, by, I don't know, going off in lots of different tangents um, all at once. Um, before I go, I wanted to quickly, and I think I'm probably over time, um, just that there's some books that I find incredibly inspirational for the science behind what is termed plant cognition or plant intelligence. And there's been loads of research uh, that has come out the past decade, even a bit more now, about um, plant communication. And we know that plants release volatile um, chemicals and molecules from their leaves when they're being attacked and they communicate um, via the wind, it's eavesdropped on. Um, you know, plants communicate via the roots. You probably all know about the Wood Wide Web, the work by Susan Simard in, um, with the redwood forests in California. Um, there is lots of incredible um, science coming out simply about the empirical nature of how plants relate to each other and the ecosystem around them. I mean, bees relate on an intimate level with, um, with, the, with their flowering plants as well and lots and lots of different animals and insects. So it's not just about the plants, it's about the whole ecosystem and how you connect with the ecosystem of your garden. And I, yeah, I think um, forming those basic relationships is uh, really, really important. So there's a book called What a Plant Knows by Daniel Kamovitz, which I highly recommend. Um, it's a really easy to read book and it's all about the different um, processes that go on in the plant um, and it's awareness, it's actual awareness of different wavelengths of light, um, how it senses different plants around it, um, how it communicates with the environment around it and so forth. And then there's another book by Monica Gagliano, which is Thus Spoke the Plant. And this is a, an extraordinary book. It, it goes again into the science behind it, but she's also um, very much a shamanic type person. Um, and there's communications going on. Um, and she blends this more spiritual, I suppose, esoteric approach to the sciences. She is a scientist herself at Perth University. Um, and then there's some more Druid books. The Healing Power of Celtic Plants by Angela Payne is really good. Um, and it goes into the Celtic sources um, of the traditionally associated Celtic herbs that we know were used um, ar archaeologically um, and in herb lore. And then there's the one by Ellen Everett Hopman, which is a Druid's herbal. So, yeah, really amazing stuff out there um, on plants and, and, and nature and connecting. And of course, Australian Druidry, um, that has been incredibly grounding, but it also gives that sense of, yeah, the real um, essential importance of connecting with the cycles of the land um, uh, in, your, in the place you live, you know. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably me. Um, I do apologise if I've talked and talked my head off, but this topic I'm really passionate about and I love a lot. So um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, have a good night and uh, I'll see you all around. I'm going to finish drinking my Earl Grey tea, which is probably cold now and probably cursing me under its, under its cool steam for not drinking it. Okay, have a good night and thank you very much for listening.